We're going to talk about the future of investigative reporting at this panel, and I'd like to introduce the panel first. Um, on the far left, on your far left is Robert Cribb. Robert Cribb is an award-winning investigative reporter and deputy investigations editor at the Toronto Star. His investigations include reports on serious food safety problems, exploitation of foreign workers, illegal slaughterhouses, fraudulent telemarketing boiler rooms, dangerous doctors, decrepit rental housing, airline safety, and government corruption. Cribb is past president of the Canadian Association of Journalists, current president of the CAG, CAJ Educational Foundation, and a lecturer at Ryerson University School of Journalism. He is co-author of Digging Deeper, a Canadian Reporter's Research Guide. And um, he brings an interesting perspective because Canada has not seen yet, at least, the massive uh, staff cuts and reductions or the bankruptcies that we've been seeing in the United States um, the past year or two, um, partly because they did not deregulate their banking system as much as we did and did not experience the same um, bubble burst um, economically and with credit and lending as, uh, as the United States has. Um, next to Robert is Andy Hall. Andy Hall is founder and executive director of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, an independent nonprofit organization that launched operations in January. The, um, the center is based at the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Journalism and produces journalism in the public interest with its partners, the Journalism School, Wisconsin Public Radio, and Wisconsin Public Television. A former investigative reporters and editors board member, Hall has won dozens of awards for his reporting over the past 26 years at the Wisconsin State Journal and the Arizona Republic. He began his career in 1982 as a copy boy at the New York Times. At the Republic, Hall helped break the Keating Five scandal involving Senator John McCain. At the State Journal, his stories over the past 18 years held government and the powerful accountable and protected the vulnerable through coverage that addressed the racial achievement gap in public schools and helped spark the creation of the nationally noted Schools of Hope volunteer tutoring program. He revealed NCAA violations by the University of Wisconsin athletes and exposed appalling conditions in neglected neighborhoods. Most recently, Andy won a first place award in 2008 for beat reporting for the National Education Writers Association. He has received national headliner Gerald Loeb, James Batten, and Inland Press Association awards. Um, and Andy is at the cutting edge of helping find new ways to conduct investigative journalism outside the traditional um, media. Next is Brant Houston. Brant Houston is the Knight Chair in Investigative and Enterprise Reporting at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where he teaches investigative and advanced reporting. He is co-author of the Investigative Reporter's Handbook and author of Computer Assisted Reporting, a Practical Guide. Houston is co-founder and coordinator of the Global Investigative Journalism Network, board president of the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, and a member of the board of the Fund for Investigative Journalism. He also is working with journalists in several states who are forming investigative journalism centers and trying to develop successful business models. Before becoming the night chair, Houston was executive director of IRE and the National in Institute for Computer Assisted Reporting, NICAR, for 12 years. Houston was a daily journalist for 17 years before joining IRE. He was an award-winning investigative reporter at the Hartford Current and the Kansas City Star, where he was part of the newsroom staff that won the Pulitzer Prize for its coverage of a hotel building collapse. Kate Perry is the assistant managing editor, Enterprise and Investigations at the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. She supervises the newspaper's team of seven investigative reporters and editors, as well as those covering state government, the congressional delegation, federal courts, health care, and a variety of topical beats. Previously, she served as the Star Tribune's ombudsman, investigating reader complaints and providing ethics training for the staff. In that role, she received the Associated Press Freedom of Information Award in 2007 for columns explaining First Amendment issues to readers. Before returning to the Star Tribune, she was senior editor at the St. Paul Pioneer Press, where the civic journalism project she spearheaded on crime, immigration, and poverty received the James Batten Award for Excellence in Civic Journalism in 1998 and 2002. This year, her team of healthcare reporters and editors received a National Headliner Award for a series on consumer choice in healthcare. And Kate is, an, is working for one of the papers 
in, in the United States that is right now in bankruptcy as she continues to lead investigative journalism. Um, I'm George Stanley. I'm the managing editor of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and have been since 1997. Uh, we do have one of the largest investigative reporting teams in the country. We were a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in investigative reporting this year and have won a Polk Award, Oaks Award, and three national headliners this year. And we won the Pulitzer Prize for local reporting last year. Um, so I'd like to start with a question and get the conversation rolling and then eventually the conversation will expand to include the whole room and, and the Twitter network. Um, so let's get straight to the point. Investigative reporting tends to be the most expensive reporting we do. It takes time and skills. Sometimes it takes a great deal of time. Um, other media have for the most part in most markets abandoned investigative reporting. Um, the broadcast model, it's, they found it to be much cheaper to have small news staffs and market the personalities of those who deliver generic police scanner reports. Radio has gone to an opinion form where they give opinion about the news in many markets. And the vast majority of investigative reporting has been done by newspapers. Newspapers across the United States are slashing costs and staff. Are we heading down the road taken by others away from investigative journalism? And if not, how will the future of watchdog reporting be financed? Uh, Kate, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Um, well, I am in this peculiar situation that I work at a newspaper that's in bankruptcy, and at the same time, we're increasing the number of people devoted to investigative reporting. That may seem in conflict. It doesn't come without terribly difficult decisions about where to get the resources to do that. But I am happy to work for an editor and managing editor who are utterly devoted to this kind of tough-minded journalism and they find a way. It, it's a priority setting issue. Is this important enough to set the priority that this is where you'll put your resources? It is, it, it uses an exhaustive amount of time. I have two reporters who just finished putting a four-part series in the paper they've been working on for seven months. Uh, for those of you who work at papers and, and some of our staff also are churning out two, three, four, or five more stories a week, it's, it's hard to imagine devoting two of your best reporters to that, for that duration to get that series. The reader response to the series has been phenomenal. And so we know readers appreciate that we're doing this. And so that, that's motivating to keep finding the resources to do it. But it is difficult. Uh, we do it in different ways. Some of those reporters are devoted to traditional, old style, deep investigative journalism. Others are working in a capacity we call whistleblower, where readers call in with things that are happening in their lives, bureaucrats who've jerked them around, and a couple of reporters dive at it and do stories on it. Uh, in addition to the seven who work directly with me, we have two in my health team who are devoted to investigative journalism and two on the business staff. So in the newsroom, we have 11 people devoted to this kind of reporting and we're working to spread the sensibility among beat reporters as well. Um, clearly to us, this is something that our readers value, and it's a kind of journalism that they can't get from other media. They just don't have the resources to do it. So, so it's a priority for us, and that's how we've been able to afford it. But it is expensive. Just getting the data to fuel these projects is expensive. Government also under economic pressure, makes the data more and more expensive to get all the time in order to, to meet their budget needs. So uh, it, it does take money, and right now that money is coming directly out of the newsroom budget. Um. Um, I'm always an optimist about investigative reporting because um, I think there's always a constant mass of it. Uh, where it's placed and where, it, um, where people uh, do it uh, depends on markets. It depends on, on the time uh, uh, of the century, actually. Uh, when I was running uh, investigative reporters and editors, I did an interview at least twice a year on the death of investigative reporting and had to tell everybody it was still alive and well and pushing forward. I think this is actually an incredible opportunity for investigative reporting, and the constant mass actually might be increased somewhat. I think uh, when people notice something is starting to go missing, they appreciate it more. Uh, I think we've also got great opportunities because of what's happened with the digital media. Uh, you can have two or three reporters now who can do an investigative story that would have taken 10 
reporters a couple of years to do. Uh, they're just stories that we are able to do now we couldn't do before. And I think uh, one trend that's happened within the industry is that there's more openness to collaborations and collaborations with each other, collaborations with citizens. That's going to improve the quality of investigative reporting. I think, uh, though, that we're going to have three to five very difficult years in, once again, uh, getting a constant stream of revenue and resources to do this. And so I'm seeing the nonprofit model and the help of foundations and individual donations is helping to bridge that gap. It's three to five years as we uh, transform ourselves. I think uh, that's the optimistic way of looking at what's happening right now. Andy, you're doing a lot of collaboration with your new project. Absolutely, and um, I uh, share Brant's optimism. I, I think that uh, we're, we're going to get through uh, this rough period, and it is a period that's going to last years, uh, but that in many states and communities around the country, uh, within several years, uh, within five years, uh, we'll be able to, we'll, we will be able to look back and see that indeed the, uh, the amount and the quality of investigative journalism uh, has actually increased uh, and, and, it, and is at a higher level than it was prior to this economic crisis. Um, I, I do think that the uh, economic crisis has forced us to take a hard look at reducing some of our old, some of the old barriers uh, to collaboration. Uh, and and uh, so long as, as we step into the collaboration, uh, we're clear with one another uh, what our standards are, what the expectations are, what our procedures are going to be, what our ethical uh, practices will be, uh, that there are, in fact, ways to collaborate. Um, it's, it's been done for uh, uh, generations in some other industries. Uh, journalism is often the last uh, to, 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 uh, to follow. Um, and um, there are, in fact, ways uh, that uh, nonprofit organizations uh, can work with uh, mainstream and ethnic uh, for-profit organizations uh, to do a better job of, of covering our communities and building on the enlightened practices of, of, of uh, organizations uh, like the Star Tribune and the Journal Sentinel, uh, drawing on the models uh, that we are seeing uh, created on the national level by uh, ProPublica, by uh, the Center for Public Integrity, which has now been around for uh, close to two decades, by the Center for Investigative Reporting at Berkeley, which has been around since the 70s. Um, there are already some good models uh, to draw up on and, and to learn from. Um, so now the next step, uh, if we agree that collaboration is, is part of our future, is to start diving in and figuring out the nuts and bolts, how, we're, how are we really going to get this done? Robert? Uh, you guys are really optimistic. <laughs> I, uh, I think we're screwed. Right? Um, I guess I, I, I would say, I, I, first of all, I want to say it's sort of, it's a bit odd, but like Kate, just this week, the Toronto Star just announced that we're adding two full-time uh, staffers to the investigative team, which in the middle of a brutal recession, I think is extraordinary. And it, and it, it says something. I think you might be hearing from the choir here. I mean, I think we're, you're hearing from people who are, obviously very committed to this and we work for places that are very committed to this. I would say that that's very counterintuitive and at least where I, where I work, investigative journalism is shrinking, there's no question about it. There's less and less investment in it. There's far less tolerance for the notion of a three month or a six month investigation. There's virtually no tolerance for it. I think in most media organizations uh, other than mine, which is obviously very committed to it. Um, and sort of one of these, one of the arguments that's always made is, well, yeah, 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 but it's being, you know, but, but we have blogs, right? We have blogs. We have do-it-yourself journalism. We have, um, uh, we have citizen journalism, and it's, it's filling in the gap, right? So it's going to be okay because there's the Internet, right? Which, of course, is dumb, right? That's not true at all. I mean, I, I don't know about blogging here, but where I live, I mean, I, I sort of refer to it as Seinfeld journalism. It's journalism about nothing. It's, it's journalism based on anecdotal observation, void of any factual basis or foundation. And if that's what's replacing, if that's what's filling in the gap of traditional, in-depth, uh, contextualized, factually verified information that is fought for uh, for weeks and months by very skilled people who are professional and know how to do this, if what's being, if what's replacing that is this stuff where I woke up today and here's what I think about abortion rights over the last five minutes that I've been thinking about it, or here's what I think about, you know, um, 
corporate bailouts, because uh, I, I saw an article yesterday. If that's what's replacing the work of, of uh, professional investigative reporters who spend weeks, months uh, digging into the facts upon which opinions are, can then be based, then I think we're in real trouble. So um, that, that's not to say there aren't positive signs, and I, I sort of agree, but um, I think it's going to be a real tough time. There's something uh, else that, that's part of that, too, I think, and that's um, investigative reporters aren't born with 20 years of experience and car skills. Right. And most investigations, as we all know, uh, rise from beat, beats and beat yeah, reporters yeah. who yeah. Uh, have good instincts and are working hard and, they're, and, they're, and they can't get a straight answer to a simple question. And the vast majority of big investigations come out of something that simple. Mm -hmm. You can't get a straight answer to a simple question. Right. There are a lot fewer beat reporters out there. What does that mean? Well, I, I just wanted to say something I hope that will help Rob's spirits. Uh, <laughs> and what I'm finding, I'm trying to track this, is the migration of experienced, uh, skilled uh, investigative reporters. I was talking to somebody last year in an interview and they said what about all the reporters leaving the LA Times there will be dozens of great reporters and I started saying well on the other hand the Center for Public Integrity has 10 more people and five more people and pretty soon I had gone up to 200 people mm -hmm. that I happened to think of that had gravitated towards the university setting where they were doing investigations with students or with the mainstream press um, they had gone to nonprofits, and so I think what we're seeing is we're not necessarily losing those people because at least in, in my case, in Andy's case, everyone else's case, I think, is investigative journalism is as much a passion, if not more, than a job. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say there's a constant mass, and that's why I also say we're going through a real transition right now. I also want to mention three years ago, uh, there were several, uh, there were a group of editors and a few other people down at the Pointer Institute, and they really thought about things, and includes Murray Kaiser from the Milwaukee Journal, and they said, you know, in the future, our franchise is journalists. One of our major franchises is going to be investigative journalism. So I think there's a recognition that investigative journalism has the highest standards of credibility and accuracy, and the people who do it will be uh, on websites that people go to for things they can trust and that will help them in their daily life and also protect the powerless and all the other things we've always done. And the, uh, the erosion of uh, beat reporting is, is a big concern. Um, and, you know, it's going to be important for uh, surviving newsrooms to, to support beat reporting and um, uh, to listen to the ideas that flow out of the beat reporters. Um, I think that um, the rise of uh, the uh, nonprofit investigative centers, uh, basic universities or freestanding, whatever shape they take, uh, can play a role then uh, through the uh, collaborative approach. Um, there can be two-way conversations between those newsrooms and the centers, and in some cases, the centers uh, can use resources from their own staffs or from students um, to go out and follow up the leads and work with the beat reporter on some coverage. Uh, so I, I think that's part of it. Another part that we could all do a lot better job about is drawing upon uh, the wisdom of the public uh, to help supplement our own knowledge of what's really going on in communities. Um, and I look forward to uh, developing some, some ways, first of all, of helping train members of the public in some basic investigative uh, reporting skills, uh, creating a, a core of what I hope would become citizen investigators here in Wisconsin. Um, who would uh, learn either through uh, interactive tools we put on the website or uh, through a series of workshops around the state, how to go out and start looking into things like uh, government officials' ethics, uh, whether they had a conflict of interest on a vote for a shopping center, that kind of thing, uh, how to look into water quality, how to look into school performance, neighborhood safety issues, uh, and that the information from those people then flows into newsrooms and investigative centers uh, in states across the country and, and supplements journalism's ability uh, to get at the truth. You know, I also, short of the kind of training that Andy's talking about for readers in investigative journalism, just making our newsrooms more accessible for a reader to call if they think <coughs> something's not Parking. quite right out there. Um, uh, you know, beat reporters are a rich, rich resource for partnering and doing mm -hmm. investigations. 
We get a lot of good ideas from readers who just find a way to call up and get the right person on the phone. And I fear too many of those phone calls get lost in newsrooms. Um, you know, and at, when I was the ombudsman, I had a lot of phone calls that were from people who would say, I don't know who to call about this, but. And they had somebody that they could call at that point. Now, the ombudsman position in Minneapolis <laughs> was gone. cut in budget cuts. Uh, I'm happy to be in the job I'm in. I was planning to go back to editing anyway. But, but you know, they've lost that easy route in. And so now they're having to try to find their way to reporters. Some are better than others at welcoming their ideas. And some of the ideas sound almost kind of goofy, kind of half-baked. You wonder if it's a quagmire. Is that person really right in their mind? But some of them really pan out. And they're worth checking out. And uh, we devote some resources to that now. So I think, I think there's something really rich to be done with the public. I, and I think we have to be honest. There's been a diminishing of the product for years. Uh, 20 years ago, the Hartford Current, where I worked, uh, changed the way the, its phone system so that I could call up and report a major bridge collapse every morning to no one. Mm -hmm. And I would leave it on the on the phone for the clerk just to make a point on the way in. Uh, <laughs> my God, there's been a terrible collapse. People are in the water. And she would always laugh at me when I came in and said that was very funny. Um, but that my point was that people could no longer get to us. Mm -hmm. And we haven't been covering beats very well for a long time, except in special cases and, and papers. And we've been bringing in migrant journalists to uh, try to understand a community and they move on two or three years later. So we haven't been that hot at it. And that's one of the reasons that we lost some of the readership. We really did. Uh, we stopped responding. Uh, try getting into a major newspaper now. It's uh, like going through airport security, except you don't get through. Um, I would be hired to help do training in a newspaper and I would cool my jets for 45 minutes in the foyer. Okay, and they're paying me. What if I was a citizen? trying to get in. And the other thing is we can't get out. We've been turned into phone list and now email list. Uh, you know, we just, the beats really did diminish. And so that's why I'm optimistic there'll be a, a much better understanding of the need for us to get out there. There's lab work and there's field work, and you've got to do both. The, um, I'm not sure the public uh, understands how much of this kind of reporting has been done by the newspapers. Um, I, I was talking to someone from the Post Intelligencer in Seattle, and uh, they were talking to a reader, and um, the reader, they told him that the paper wasn't going to be around anymore. They were closing down. And the re reader said, well, I'll still read you online. And yeah, they're going to try with their 20 reporters to do what, what uh, 200 reporters used to do. Uh, to put out a newspaper, but um, we know that that's not likely to succeed. Um, and there are some young people in this room, and there's some students and some um, uh, people looking for work as uh, investigative reporters someday, or that's what they want to do. Do you have any recommendations uh, for how they can get started now and, um, and for how we keep this thing going? You know, it's that's to a certain extent it's like it's always been you you start with simple things you start by learning you start by going to training when IRE or there's a night car seminar offered you go to the seminar you learn to do the basic techniques of investigative reporting to think deliberately and methodically about getting to the truth and peeling back the layers so nothing about that has changed I don't there's there's no magic bullet Where to get, get into the first this. job well, that's a good question at this well, point. Well, actually, I think there's always good news. Uh, is somebody, one of my students recently said to me, he said, I know I have a great advantage. I'm young and I'm cheap. So that <laughs> means I will work long hours for little pay, and there's always an opportunity for a person like that. I think there are going to be these websites, these nonprofits. I also think uh, there are a number of niche publications. Uh, they're the equivalent of uh, covering beats. They're going through a little bit of bad time, but they're going to be needed. Also, I would say if uh, the stimulus package is going to be good for journalism in, in, in one way, is that everyone's going to want to know where the money's going. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's some um, uh, for-profit um, state news services already starting up. They're pretty excited about the possibilities and a bad time of doing well. So I think the one thing is, uh, 
as a student or a young person getting into this, it's, there's not the usual hierarchy of, of doing this, but you've got to look at all the multimedia opportunities that are out there. You have to have really decent database analysis skills. Uh, it would help to speak a second language. Um, and it would be helpful to put some stuff on the web, but I wouldn't get too hung up on being able to post things to the web. There are plenty of people who do that. It's the content and the methodology and the credibility, and people are going to want that. The, the other thing is, I think it's a really high bar to think you're going to walk in a newsroom on your first job and say, I'd like to do investigative journalism. Um, but I do think you can still get beginning jobs in newsrooms and bring an investigative sensibility to the cop beat, to the, the higher education beat, to other kinds of beats that people begin to migrate in early in their career. And if they try to save a little time to do a little investigating on the beat, editors will notice. There's nothing like a great story idea to win your editor over to giving you time. So you just keep digging for the good ideas and present them and say, if you can, if you can just get me two or three days. You just beg for time. That's how everybody's always done it. And, and then you start to show that you can do this kind of work. And you can do it in the beats. You can do it in your first job. But you can do it outside the papers by being entrepreneurial. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, if Matt Drudge can get a big following, somebody who does a lot of reading mm -hmm. of documents, we don't read enough, uh, and you're blogging about those, you build up your following. I think uh, every journalist is going to have to be much more entrepreneurial now. Um, and you might have to think about being an IF Stone for those who don't know, that is somebody that did a newsletter that was in the black for years by reading uh, federal documents. And the, the, only, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, the only thing I could add to your question, George, about uh, you know what about getting that first job is um, certainly uh, a, a journalist's chances of, of getting a good first job are greatly increased if they have something tangible to show those editors. So you know you've heard it before, but work for the college newspapers. Uh, work for uh, ethnic media in the community. Um, you know, with the, in, a, in a community like Madison, um, there are uh, Hmong publications, Spanish-speaking publications, uh, publications that dig deep into issues affecting the African-American community. Um, and editors love to see journalists who've proven an ability uh, to cross cultural barriers and, and, and uh, look into issues affecting the, the disadvantaged in society. Um, and um, that combined with the range of other s skills that uh, Brent and Kate were talking about. Um, and on the training front, you know, even right here in Madison uh, next weekend, uh, IRE has a better watchdog workshop. For 20 bucks, a student can get a full day of training. Uh, so it's a good, good place um, to start. How do we make our uh, argument in the marketplace? Um, the, the, the earlier panel was talking about, um, Scott Anderson from CNN was talking about how they watched page views by the hour to decide uh, what was the important stories they were focusing attention on. Um, I know if we did that and, and really wanted to focus our attention on maximizing page views, we'd do even more stories about Brett Favre, even though he's not playing anymore. And, uh, and every time Britney Spears and, and Lindsay Lohan got in trouble, they go right to the top because that's what drives page views. So, um, and then you, you read about the Chicago Tribune, uh, uh, a newspaper with a wonderful uh, history uh, this week, their marketing department, sending out stories before uh, they were published online or in print to, to see which ones the readers like the most. How do we make the argument for the standards of verification, investigative reporting, serious in-depth journalism in today's marketplace? Well, here's an interesting thing that happened to us last week. Um, we have something new in Minneapolis that's called a print exclusive, which means very good stories that run in the Sunday paper only run in the printed newspaper and don't go online for several days. This is an experiment. And w my investigative series was one of those. And so we, we thought we would die. We, we thought this would be great online, and here it's going to just be in the printed paper for days. By the time it goes online, the interest won't be there. We were really surprised. Um, ran out Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. On Wednesday, it started to go online and ran out through Friday. It was the top read story on our website all three days. It beat Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> it, you know, I mean, uh, readers are very grateful for this kind of journalism. And, uh, you know, 
back to the ombudsman days when they when we had investigative reporters working on the bridge collapse in Minneapolis we had two reporters who very quickly leapt on that story and began to find out that there was faulty design there was faulty maintenance and these stories went in the paper and a couple of them popped up on CNN of course because they're looking for people to talk about things and I started getting phone calls from readers right away saying you should have them do more of that uh, readers love when newspapers do this kind of work they know they're not going to get it anywhere else I don't think they're all naive about the quality of what's online and they they do realize when there's depth and substance in the newspaper and we hear from them in droves that is a great argument to me for me to take and say there's a business reason for doing this kind of journalism it's not just a journalistic reason we can show that this is a kind of journalism that attracts eyes in the printed paper and it attracts eyes on the website and that's very valuable and it's very compelling and I really don't mind that it's a business reason if that matches my journalistic reason we all win that's just great so um, I, I think the readers are doing it for us they they want this and they do speak up and say so when they like it so I'd say you know when we, we just finished doing a big project and and I was just reminded of it because the by far the number one kind of response that, that we get in emails and phone calls is not even specific to the, the content of the story. It almost doesn't matter, but we inevitably get overwhelmed with comments that just say thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, just thank you for existing and doing this kind of work. And that's why I buy the Toronto Star. I think there is a real appetite for it. I, I don't think it's something that can be measured in reader surveys. I mean, if we'd asked readers six months ago what do you want to read nobody would have said I want to read about exploitation of foreign workers because why, how would they because it does it's not even on the agenda it's not even in the consciousness right but when it's presented in a thorough complete um, compelling way they're all over it and, and you know so to me it's all it's been ever thus there's always been Britney Spears stories but Britney Spears is a lost leader for us it brings them in the door and then uh, and then we give them the, the stuff that that they maybe even didn't know they wanted but but they did. Rand, you said something interesting earlier about a department store. Right. I think what we're looking for is uh, what's going to support this. Um, uh, I always thought of a newspaper sort of a big department store and the investigative journalism maybe the jewelry uh, counter. Uh, and I think what we're doing now is looking for what will support uh, this and that's what we're going to have to struggle through and that's why we need some charity uh, while we figure it out but I think we will figure it out one other thing I wanted to say is that a lot of journalists did not get into journalism to do math and I do think we need to count better uh, when you count page views I'm not sure we're always counting hover time and that certainly became much more interesting for broadcasters a number of years ago is how long does somebody stick uh, with the screen and I think we need to count that. We also d haven't counted very well on the impact of investigative stories. We tend to count the months leading up to them or the <laughs> weeks. We don't tend to count very well the, all the stories that are produced after the first series or the first story appears. I was, editors always <coughs> drove me crazy. They count the months I worked on it, but they would not count the number of stories in reaction to the first story. Mm -hmm. So I think counting is going to be very important now, if only for survival and then for thriving. Um, you made some good points, too, earlier about um, technology. Um, and, um, you know, we've talked about how technology has hurt newspapers uh, with the uh, new business model. Um, that hasn't been developed yet, but it has also made a lot of things less expensive. Um, investigative, a lot of investigative reporting tools are less expensive to use now, um, and, and to get to people. Interactive databases, a lot of digital data is out there that you don't have to travel to get and copy and make paper copies of and go through that whole rigmarole. There's um, there's also a lot of savings that we've made in. Um, in our own industry through technology. Uh, we had 30 people in our news information center once clipping out stories and putting them in little envelopes that were cross-referenced so people could find things. Um, we had a composing room full of people laying out pages. We had lots of secretaries typing up letters on letterheads that email kind of blew away. So um, there, there, there are cuts that newspapers can make without um, harming that core. Do you think 
in general, uh, newspaper companies are doing a good job of making those decisions? And, and if, if... No. And, and why is that? I think we fought technology and technology won. Um, and, but it was only the first fight. I think we need to come back now and embrace this technology and start to make it work for us. Um, I walked into newsrooms in the late 90s where the reporters had no, uh, no way of getting out to the web. Uh, they were worried about the hackers out there. Um, it, you know, that, that's just killing. I, I think, uh, you know, we're going to be lean and mean and hopefully not, uh, not to the point that we disappear. But we didn't do a good job. And we've got to accept that. And I think now we need to move on and figure out how to really make use of these tools. And, um, and we need to go and pillage other professions' uh, expertise even more than we have before. Computer programming. Just the, we've got people out there who can help us. We don't have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to running algorithms to find things. And uh, our, our skills are putting things together quickly and seeing a big picture quickly. Uh, it's a strange combination of skills and then being able to present it and communicate it in a way that really matters to people. And um, we need to preserve that and, and do more of it. So, uh, but no, I mean, we, we screwed up. Let's move on. I mean, <laughs> that's all there is to it. <laughs> I think, yeah, you're going to see, um, uh, and Brad is active uh, in, in some of these efforts, uh, you're going to see some of this, the powerful analytical tools that are being used uh, by our own government to keep watch over us through Homeland Security programs uh, turn, turned by journalists to take a look at what the government's really up to. Uh, some of the uh, intensive uh, data mining efforts and um, methods of, of analyzing uh, content. Um, you know, we're going to move far beyond our traditional use of Excel and spreadsheets, although those will remain uh, essential tools uh, for breaking news and, and projects. Um, we're going to uh, also, I think, do a better job of involving the public again in helping us conduct some of these analyses. Um, and you're seeing that right now with ProPublica, uh, getting uh, the Obama administration uh, financial disclosure forms, analyzing them quickly to the extent that the ProPublica staff can put some coverage together, but then putting the, the full uh, PDF version of that financial disclosure form onto the ProPublica website and, and, again, seeking the wisdom of the crowd, what else do you folks see in here? All of a sudden you can put hundreds of thousands of additional eyeballs to work well, look in helping what, analyze it. Look what happened in the New York Times. Uh, they go ahead and they do a story <coughs> on public, uh, the government documents released on alleged torture or inappropriate, harsh, brutal treatment. Uh, and they didn't know how many times uh, the waterboarding occurred. And it was two bloggers that, by going into the documents, having more time than the Times folks, <laughs> going in and they found out what the actual number of waterboardings were for one particular guy, 183 and then 80 something over here. So that's something we can point to right now by getting those raw documents out there. We can determine authenticity. We can also get a lot of people doing a lot of research. The other thing I wanted to add was this whole citizen journalism and getting back to citizens uh, really tells us how far away we got. When I started off in the business, uh, it, now I have to look about it, I said, oh, that's right. I was including the citizens in my reporting. I was like going to accountants and saying, how do you read these documents? I can't make sense of this budget. Mm -hmm. Well, now I can do it on the web really quickly with maybe 30 accountants. So all the citizen and civic journalism just told us how much we were retreating into our fortresses. And, you know, so the good news is we're out there and about again. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's one, one other thing. Been talking about technology in terms of the research and the reporting. The, the big element that I think is missing is then taking it the next step and presenting it to the public. I think we're doing a horrible job uh, at at uh, getting that information made public. For example, in certainly in Canada, the process of trying to get uh, your database that you fought six months to get onto the company's website, onto the newspaper's website. I don't know what it's like down here, but it is uh, fighting with the IT departments in these newspapers. I mean, no, they're not journalists, clearly. They have no sense of this, but <laughs> it is utterly impossible for us to get a, 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 a databases with vast public interest, uh, daycare abuse cases, uh, mm -hmm. restaurant inspection cases. I mean, these are databases that clearly have tremendous public interest, but uh, for some reason or another, we are so resistant to, uh, to take the steps, so we rely on these services like Caspio and these kinds of services, but there's very real limitations to that, and, and ultimately, who wants to, 
who wants to be handing or let somebody else run your own data? You want to be doing it yourself. So that's certainly the Canadian experience. We're, we're having a really hard time with that. Now, you've got people uh, throwing stuff on many eyes that papers or newsrooms, I tend to say newsrooms instead of newspapers now, uh, data and information that goes onto an open source thing like many eyes website. Um, you know, it should be out of the newsroom's websites. Yeah. It's I a mean, lost opportunity a, when we don't uh, get it. You, right. Don't you think that, um, I mean, Brian, I, I, I'm, I'll tell the room that I think you, um, in particular, as much as anyone in this country, have trained uh, the, one of the greatest generations of young journalists that, that we've ever seen. We have tremendous uh, computer assisted reporting skills and, and investigative skills in our young reporters now that we've never had before. But that's still not the same as being a computer scientist and a true uh, person that can, uh, the, the people that built Google and the people that are really masters of the web. And it seems to me that we need some of those people in our newsrooms. We, we need to be collaborating with them. Um, we need to learn from them and they learn from us. I think one of the major things that was sad to see in the early days of the web is that newspapers would set up a separate website apart from the newsroom and we kept the two apart and of course they were two cultures that didn't like each other very much for the most part but they were people who could bridge that and so you see something like the WashingtonPost.com being brought back to the Washington Post that's another place that we lost some time but as I said that was just the first round you know we can win the second round and do a lot better well should we open it up to the uh, audience <coughs> uh, in the good old days, um, we expanded our... When were those? <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, uh, investigative journalism units were expanded, and they were expanded. It was an ex expansion of staff. Um, for Kate and George, you both, I think, George, you said, too, that uh, your expansion came at the expense of other staff members. So really isn't uh, the current investigative journalism uh, focus really driven more by research and marketing than uh, that it's going to, in, in fact, um, increase readership and subscriptions and loyalty. Um, and, and you're doing it at the, at the expense of other areas of the, of the uh, paper. And so maybe in two or three years, is there any concern that if this doesn't uh, turn the subscription tide, that basically these people in the, that have been added will be maybe in a couple of years from now asking you know, grooms to prove they got master's degrees? Well, would that I had really good research that yeah. proved all this. A research is something that was cut long ago out of newspaper budgets, so, so I don't really have the research. I have anecdotally my own experience, and it's reflected in the experiences of the editor and managing editor, and so they feel the same sense that this will drive people to read the paper. We just, we can feel it. Um, the cuts that have come in our newsroom, our priority is to keep reporters on the street. And so when we have to make those terror, dreadful cuts in the staff because of the economy and the budget, reporters are the last thing that we look to cut. We, we throw our bodies in front of them and try to prevent those cuts. It, it reduces the staff in other areas that, that are very, very valuable. It hurts. There, there are no easy choices here. And, um, but we've managed to preserve our reporting staff pretty well. Um, you know, there are, there are always different decisions being made every year about what we will report on, who will report on, how many people will you have here, how many people we have there. We, we're constantly revising that, and that's been true the whole time I've been in journalism. We've never stopped. It's just that it's squeezed a little tighter now, and the decisions are a little harder. They're just the same decisions. Yeah, you know, and over the past years, the beat reporters have been more uh, breaking news than getting yeah. as much time to get into stuff. And so I think we've had a realization that when it comes to breaking news, uh, the fire and uh, the ambulance and all that, um, people out there with cell phones are doing a better job on the initial part uh, than we can do because we simply don't have the numbers out there anymore. Uh, but I do support you on the fact that marketing research uh, has seldom helped us in any way in journalism, uh, in investigative journalism, and in fact led to some really bonehead decisions on things to do. Uh, if we had better marketing people, we'd be in better shape. Yeah. <laughs> How do you know you want the, the story uh, that you just read and that took six months for reporters to do until you read it and you didn't know it was a problem? Well, when I was at the Hartford Current, the marketing department decided that we should 
ranked stories on where the advertisers were in particular communities. And also, they had this idea that people didn't work in one town and live in another. And it, it created a, a year-long mess. It took a year to straighten that out. So <laughs> if marketing's there, it's uh, not been helping too much. There's a tweet deck? Or yes. OK. I actually have a question for you. Uh, there, there is, it is on, OK. Um, there's an issue here that we failed to touch on, and that is citizens and their lack of civic duty. If you're doing great investigative work, but it's not being read enough to be supported, what can we do to get people, particularly young people, more civically engaged and caring about what's important in their community? I'll, I'll, I'll just start real quick <laughs> by saying that um, the feedback we get, I, I, I will echo what Kate and others have said, we get far more positive and strong feedback and impact to our investigative stories than anything else we do. It's anecdotal, I can't prove that, but I just know it because 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 so much of it comes in, and there I just say one other thing, I I love this generation, this new generation. <laughs> I think they're some of the most civic-minded um, people I've ever come across as a group. Um, uh, they uh, they seem to be very into uh, their uh, volunteerism. They they do seem to be into it. It actually seems to me that we should be doing very well with this group and, and, uh, and we've just got to find the way to reach them um, because uh, I think they are into civics. That's what I see anyway. Yeah, well, look how they flexed their muscles in the last election and, and that will inform their whole lives, the success that they had. And um, so, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think there's a lot to like about this generation. and. Um, you know, it's just finding the way for us to connect with them through our website or our newspaper. And uh, but that interest in deep interest in politics and the, I have forgotten about the volunteerism is half the battle to getting people interested in the news. Um, so yeah, right, you're uh, teaching. Yeah. Um, I've got as many students as ever interested in getting out there and doing reporting. I, I think we do go in cycles on how uh, deep our sense of outrage is. And I think um, when we don't have as much outrage or we're living in fear, um, you don't get the reaction to stories you might get. When people think there's a chance of pro progress, uh, at changing things, at protecting the weak, you'll get a lot of that. I think we're entering a phase of uh, increased outrage. Uh, just look what's happening over the, the whole fiscal mess. Uh, until a few couple of years ago, it seemed like a CEO could run away with 50 million bucks and gee, I wish I could get a piece of that. Now suddenly, oh, uh, we don't want them to have that. So I think it goes in cycles in terms of how people respond to it. I, I actually think, my, my, I've been teaching for like eight years, and I, I would say in the last couple of years, my students are more engaged in this stuff than ever. Like, I think we're, that's not, the, I don't think that's the problem. I don't think that there's a lack of engagement in the young people. I think that we're not giving them anything to be engaged about. Like, I just think it, this, this increase in engagement is having at the same time as we're having a decrease in, in the kind of work that engages them. I, I, I just think it's, uh, it's too bad. Yeah, that's, I agree. Um, just to, going to what Andy said a, a, a while ago, I'm fairly sanguine in some ways because of the retreat, not retreat, that's the wrong word, but because of the building of independent autonomous centers of investigation in universities and in nonprofits pro publica that large investigative issues will continue to get done and maybe even get done in a way that's better and more consistent. I'm most worried in the coming period about the very mid-range investigations in local communities, mm -hmm. those investigations that, that are on the edge of what we, we might call enterprise, but, but enterprise rising to the level of investigation, not necessarily as big as the Milwaukee Journal's pension scandal. Although that might be a good example of a, of a story that grew out of beat reporting. What happens as we see this migration of experienced investigation to the universities and nonprofits, what happens to that mid-range in local daily journalism in local communities? What? Well, well, we have, we have uh, something called whistleblower, and I think you have a comparable have a public uh, investigator. There you go. And uh, they're aimed right, at, right there. They're, <laughs> they're right there at the mid-level investigation and uh, writing about helping people. Helping yeah. people who've had a bad turn. Who was the reporter uh, in the case? I mean, uh, James Schiffer is, is. Yes, too, but also just numbers and resource assignments. How is that? 
Well, um, we started with James uh, about a year ago, and he's just this very enthusiastic guy who really cranks it out. He has a column that deals with somebody's issue every Sunday, and then he also does stories that land on page one regularly about individual very interesting cases. Uh, we added an investigative reporter who part of her job involves whistleblower type tips that come in. James is overwhelmed with whistleblower tips, by the way. Talk about getting reporters to, or readers to call somebody. He, he can't get to them all. And then now we've just added yet another position to that endeavor. So it's its own little enterprise. And, and so you're right when you say, you know, there's a hunger for that kind of mid-level investigation because the demand is, is enough that we're able to keep adding bodies to it. Um, well, two, two and more, and a half, and then some of the tips go out to beat reporters who also work on them. So I, I, I want to skip outside the, the newsroom model that we've had. I think a new model is developing, and we really don't have a sense of it yet. If you look at some of the things that have been done with social media in terms of instant demonstrations in, in countries where people are text messaging each other or they center in a, on a particular thing that's uh, – injustice that's going on. I, I think outside of our discussion, our knowledge, a, a whole new way of doing that kind of mid-level or very local <coughs> level kind of reporting, which deals with injustice, which deals with unfairness or problems, I think this social media is going to give us a lot, uh, a lot of new ways to approach it. And the people who are best at it and who show some expertise will become the leaders and that will be something that people really want. And uh, the one thing I could add, uh, Lou, uh, in response to your question would be, yeah, you're seeing it at the Metro paper, you know, like the, the Journal Sentinel, you've got your public investigator blog uh, with uh, Raquel uh, Rutledge and Ellen Gabler. Um, and I'm sure they uh, have, again, have no shortage of story ideas. Um, and then um, here in Wisconsin, the, uh, the investigative center is created specifically to, to step into some of that gap you're, des you're describing, that growing gap. Um, and certainly um, uh, in our early discussions with uh, print, online, and broadcast media around the state, um, we've been uh, greeted uh, overall um, very warmly, but probably most warmly out in the hinterlands of the state, uh, places where now uh, growing numbers of uh, newspaper editors are telling us that uh, entire communities are going uncovered. Um, that used to be covered a little bit here and there, and now because of recent cuts, uh, they're not covered at all. Uh, so our hope is um, that the Investigative Center, uh, its uh, professional staff, its students, uh, collaborations uh, with um, media organizations uh, in those communities, um, and uh, potentially, you know, at some further point, uh, some additional uh, journalism students in other parts of the state, and also um, uh, pro bono uh, legal help. Uh, who have uh, signed up uh, to, to help uh, the Investigative Center. Perhaps all of those resources uh, here and ultimately in, in other parts of the country uh, could help I reinvigorate uh, that coverage uh, in those communities. I'm a little worried, though, Lou, about uh, one thing. And uh, I, I think that what Andy's doing and ProPublica um, and the big papers that will, keep, that will keep their making good choices will keep doing the big stuff and some of the little stuff. Um, what, but um, I think um, Clark Hoyt made an excellent point um, earlier when he talked about we, we need this to work commercially. The nonprofit model is, is going to be a tiny sliver of what we need here and a tiny sliver of what we've been doing. Um, our paper alone probably spends uh, in-house, outhouse lawyers uh, 200 grand a year just fighting for open records and open meetings. I mean, how many foundations are going to pay for that kind of stuff? I mean, it's just not going to happen. So we got to find a way to make this commercially successful. Another tweet? <laughs> uh, this is a little bit of a challenge to uh, the thread that you've um, been pursuing. And it, um, the, the uh, reader says, do traditional news organizations really get the culture of the web? Do they know that everything has changed? We're not your consumers anymore. We're actively in this now. We should be every bit as much a part of your investigations as your reporters. Will you involve us rather than talk at us? That's what brant has been saying. Uh, might want to elaborate on. Well, I... I I think it's a good point. I think it's happening. I think where we have to move from now, uh, we've been in an adversarial role, and I do think we get, need to be more collaborative. I think part of what's happening to the news industry also will let um, 
allow the citizens to be a little less aggressively angry uh, so long as this is inclusive. It's a two-way street. Um, you know, we were talking at people and then the citizens were talking back at us. I think there's a real recogni recognition of uh, the power of crowdsourcing. I think there's a real recognition of the power of the expertise that's out there. Um, and, you know, we've had bad reporters. We'll have uh, bad citizens in terms of the information they give. That's where ethical standards, credibility, everything's going to come into play. That's that part, as I, I'm echoing this morning, that's not going to change. Mm -hmm. But there's no question we've got to work better together. Like I said at the beginning, we, we somehow retreated into fortresses, and we started looking at the readers and the viewers as specimens. And guess what? We're, you know, we're all in the same neighborhood. I will defend uh, the mainstream media, though, to a certain extent. And I agree with everything Brent just said, and I think we're speaking the same language but different pieces of it. A lot of the criticism aimed and Clark was talking about it earlier at the mainstream media, uh, is by angry people who want the news to reflect what they think. I see it every single day. Now, those people are not, we're not going to ever make happy because that's not what we do. Um, and um, and we, we do have to market what we really do and tell the general public and the people that do want verification and fact checking and whatever we find to be the truth to be reported whether they they want to know that or not there's plenty of things we report that we don't want to report but that's what we find and that's what we have to do so um, sometimes in that anger at the main, main at what we do there's uh, that we're not reflecting what their opinion of what the news should be um, and not only that but um, Citizen journalism is great, and we're going to get a lot of tips from people, and we need to be much more responsive to people. But um, not everybody is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter. Um, in fact, they're rare in every newsroom. Um, people who, there's very few people that work for 40 years in the business that have some of those skills. So um, they're in the top 10% of what we do. They work really hard to get there. They're talented, and they work very hard. So there's some people out there that have very special skills that I, that I hope we can hold on to. I actually have a question. Um, following up on that, and with all of you, I remember a group called the Western Journalism Center back in the 80s and 90s that was basically a, a well-funded sort of ha hatchet organization going after political enemies. As you move from institution-based investigative journalism to this more free-form investigative journalism, do you as investigators worry about um, the rise of hatchet organizations? Well, an another way to put it would be opposition research has always existed in political organizations and and they do try to to call newspapers and plant stories and we have to have our eyes open and see where it's coming from and, and uh, what the motive might be behind that. But um, I think there should be worry among readers about that, that what they're reading may not be quite what it's being portrayed as. Well, it's already happened. Mm -hmm. When yeah. we got the 527s and you, you had both right and left. So I think, I think part of the good news of this is we'll start to recognize who's real and who's not and start to have a discussion about who's got a very specific agenda and who is simply trying to start out with a hypothesis that can be proven right or wrong. And that's the real difference between a journalist and an advocate. And uh, I think this is going to heighten our recognition. I mean, right now, the moment any of these centers starts, it's going to be, okay, who's paying? Mm -hmm. And how's the money controlled? And do they have control over the stories and, and all that? Those are excellent discussions to have. And we should have been having them about a whole set of groups over the last eight years and ten years Let's on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just in the process of trying to... Canada has no no form of nonprofit uh, investigative center, the likes of which are becoming popular here. So, I'm just in the process of uh, proposing one and trying to get it going. And that's sort of the number one question that keeps getting asked: is how is that going to work? Ultimately, whoever's footing the bill is going to have some kind of interest in whatever it is, and then how is that going to mesh with uh, the credibility of the work? And, and it's a very very difficult question. I mean. It's still in a, in, in, in a sort of abstract mode because we don't actually have anyone giving us money. So. Well, the, these things are always a, they're always a struggle. If you're for profit and you had advertising, you know, how did you convince people that advertisers 
weren't always steering what you were doing. Uh, the moment I got into nonprofits, a friend told me you've been in nonprofits, said, well, remember, newspapers have advertisers and uh, nonprofits have uh, funders. Right, but, but uh, newspapers but, have dozens of advertisers. Exactly, and that's exactly right. And that's exactly one of the things we're approaching is that if you're going to have a nonprofit, you're going to have to have a wide base of individual donors and supporters. But you still have your major advertisers. You will still have your major funders. And so these things, there's no one solution. These things are always a struggle. You don't do good journalism by not struggling to do it. it you know, if it was easy, everybody could do it. There's very smart people out there, very, very smart people making lots of money trying to hide the truth. And I think it's a bigger industry than it's ever been. And, and, and Brant's exactly right. It's, it's a, it'll never not be a struggle. It'll be a fight every day to try to get. Uh, and they're, very, they're more sophisticated than they've ever been. When you talk about government, government regulation and, and knowing how the process works and how to manipulate it. Uh, our, we've been investigating the chemical industry uh, about the bisphenol A and other chemicals are getting in the food supply for three years. And that's what it's taken with three reporters and then two reporters uh, just to get through the fog and the, and the tremendous sophistication of the people who have completely manipulated the regulation system to their advantage. I just, uh, just wondered about uh, competition and the impact on investigative journalism. It used to be the crosstown paper wanted to beat the other one, never wanted to be scooped, wanted to have the best stories. Has the, has the decline in competition hurt investigative journalism? There's only one person <laughs> with a crosstown. <laughs> <laughs> we, we still have a crosstown newspaper, the Pioneer Press, where I used to work, and I have fond memories of it. Um, and it's, we fight, and it, in, it energizes both newspapers. Now, both newsrooms have had a contraction of resources that that we feel, but uh, it's great to have competition. I think it keeps us both healthier, um, and uh, I, hope, I hope we continue to have two newspapers in the Twin Cities. I think we need to redefine competition. Yes. I think we have more competition <laughs> than we've ever had. Um, when you know that two bloggers can out-report the Times on documents that they got, um, you know, and I'm not putting it down. Those are incredible documents, and it's incredible work the bloggers did. Uh, but that tells you there's a lot of competition out there. If you, if you say your only competition is another newspaper uh, then, and you're the last one standing, then you've triumphed and there is no competition. But that is a very enclosed view. Uh, and that's another reason we've got to embrace technology and start to get out there more. You've got lots of competition. Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think Toronto might be the most competitive newspaper market in North America. At least that's what we read sometimes. We have four, four very vigorous daily papers and two free papers. So uh, competition is really, really heavy there. And I think it's ultimately it, it's a no-brainer, but competition is great for journalism. There's just no question about it. We're probably going to lose one. That's what the experts say. We're probably going to lose one, possibly two papers if this keeps going. And, you know, it's inevitable that that's, I, I think, it obviously hurts. Um, one of the cool things that's happened, though, uh, which we haven't really talked about much, is this collaboration thing. I've never, this never happened to me before, but I've just spent three months collaborating with a reporter at the CBC on an on investigation. And we, we had a major um, listeria outbreak in Canada that killed 22 people. So it's the first time the Star has ever done it, and I think the first time the CBC has ever done it. But we, we teamed up, which was extraordinary to negotiate this between these two organizations. They're the two biggest news organizations in the country. We spent three months. Uh, we dug in together. We broke a number of uh, significant stories and pushed some public policy, and it was, an, I think, an overwhelming success. And, and just the, the, I've never experienced anything quite like it, the, the power of a, a major story landing in the biggest newspaper, on the biggest TV network, and across the country in radio all at once. It's, it's, it's a nuclear bomb, and it's impossible for politicians and the public and the other media to ignore, and it's just an amazingly powerful thing. Not sure that would have happened in a different climate. So, it it is a bit of a mother of invention, I think. Like it's it's a really cool thing to have gone through, and and uh, if it clears the way for for future partnerships on the right story, even after this horror show's over, um, I think that'll be a, a remarkable legacy. Thank you very much.